Good afternoon. Thank you. Steve asked me to say some words about my experiences with the press. And they are inextricable from my experiences with Duke, which began in a very odd way. My wife, Jane Tompkins, and I were sitting in the very small kitchen of our small house in Baltimore, Maryland, when the phone rang. Actually, we weren't sitting. There, weren't, there wasn't room enough for a table. <laughs> phone rang. And the person at the other end identified herself as Ernestine Friedel, dean of the College of Arts and Sciences at Duke University. And I was suitably impressed. She then said, we at the College of Arts and Sciences would like to offer you and Jane Tompkins full professorial appointments at Duke University. And I said, and this is literal, I said, you mean you're inviting us to apply for full professorial appointments at Duke University? And she said, no, we are offering you those appointments. Now, any of you who know anything about the way the academic world works <laughs> will realize how extraordinary a moment this is. It was only later that I found out what we call the back story. <laughs> Perhaps some of you in this room don't know it. But in 1985, when this transpired, Duke University was not the Duke University that we know today. Duke University was a good regional university, which thought of itself in competition with Emory and Vanderbilt and thought of itself as never being able to approach the heights of the University of Virginia. That's the way the university conceived of itself. And in fact, the English department, I found out when I got here, was made up largely of people who felt that the fact that they now held positions in Duke, at Duke, likely for life, was a sign that they had failed that they hadn't been able to get back to New Haven or Princeton or Cambridge. That's the way, and the rest of the world viewed Duke in the same way. What happened was that those of us who came in 1985 began to see an opportunity here, an opportunity to transform something that was by and large complacent, and for good reasons, there's lots to be complacent had a wonderful time in building up the Duke English Department to become something that was both glorious and, as Reynolds has already suggested, notorious. Uh, one of the highlights of low five years and a kind of rump sixth year, which I never quite understood, I stepped down as the chair. And as Steve said, I was in California. Actually, I was at the second uh, hotel across from uh, Grauman's Chinese Theater that I received a phone call from Tommy Langford telling me that he and Steve Cohen would like me to be executive director of the Duke University Press. I questioned him about this, making the obvious point that I had no experience whatsoever uh, except as a gadfly critic uh, with the university press world. But as Steve said, he and Tommy were persuasive in different telephone calls. And I came back from California ready to take on this assignment and ready to find out in the course of time what the assignment was. So I went to see Nan Cohen, uh, who was the president and a new president at that moment, who told me that she had changed her mind? Do you remember this? No. <laughs> <laughs> never heard it. Never heard it. She had changed her mind. Why? Because the word had gotten out, and the conservative members of the faculty were protesting to the president's office that this was the worst thing that they could imagine. It would be the end of the press 
just as it had been the end of the English department to have me in that position. So I went, uh, she told me this in her office, uh, and uncharacteristically, I said, usually I'm calm in these situations. I am, but I was not calm in that situation. She told me that she would wait a while until things had settled down, and then she would, then she would perhaps consider doing this. And I told her, people who wait a while until things settle down end up never doing anything. We parted. Uh, but after a few days, I guess, I don't know whether it was that remark, I doubt it. But for whatever reason, I did, in fact, take up the position. Uh, all kinds of new work was being done in the humanities and social sciences. And only one press that I knew of, at least, was, in fact, focusing on this new work. And that was the University of Minnesota, which had more of a social science than a literary, uh, uh, I think, emphasis. So we saw an opportunity. And the opportunity was made possible by the people that we had here at Duke who could then contact their friends. And then the word went out, and we began to get better manuscripts. Uh, and once we signed up someone, friends of that someone would become interested and receptive uh, to our calls. Of course, this wouldn't have meant anything if we not have extraordinary editors like Reynolds and Valerie and Ken, and had we not, and did we not have extraordinary production uh, and, and books uh, that looked as if you might want to pick them up and read them. Uh, it was a exhilarating four years. It was, in fact, four years that I now consider the best years of my professional life. The way I put it, both to myself and to those who ask, is simple. I say that being at the Duke University Press is the best job I ever had. For many reasons, but chiefly for three. One, the combination of an intellectual and commercial enterprise is unique. Everyone at the press is simultaneously interested in the ideas developed in our books and in the very complicated mechanics, first of producing those books and then of marketing those books. And thinking about how to do justice to both aspects of the university press world was itself uh, an exercise in high intellectualism. Second, in being a member of a press such as this one, you have the great joy of actually seeing the product you have worked on emerge within 18 months or two years or depending on the author, three or four years. But after a while, there it is. It's extraordinary. It was just a conversation you had in a coffee shop in Chicago or New York one day. And then years later, there it is. But the third reason, and the most important reason why I consider this the best job that I have ever had, that is because I was working with true professionals who are also wonderful human beings, and many of whom, I am pleased to say, are in this room. Thank you. <laughs>